Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us on the Small Talk Podcast. My name is TJ, and I'm coming to you from the magical world of the editing booth. Canon and I got really excited and started recording episodes well before we started getting really the appropriate equipment to do so. Specifically, my microphone absolutely sucked. So I wanted to let you know that by episode four, I start using the microphone I'm using right here instead of the crummy gaming headset microphone that I was using. We're aware of that issue, and we moved to fix it, but we couldn't really afford to lose three episodes. Also, by episode four, we start turning on the webcams, though we had some issues. And on episode five, which I have not gotten to yet, the webcam should be working properly, I hope. Uh, Canon had some technical difficulties. Anyway, you slice it, I just wanted to say thank you for hanging out with us and checking out these first couple of episodes while there are some technical difficulties. They get a lot better, we get more confident, and we learn a little bit about podcasting as we go from going back and listening to episodes and editing them and seeing what did or didn't work. And maybe you can hear my cat yelling at some birds. Anyways, thanks again, and I'll see you in the episode. Cheers. Uh, well, folks, in the grim darkness of the third episode of the Small Talk podcast, there's only one thing, right? TJ, there is only paint. There is only paint. Yes. And what is that paint on this week? I hear you asking, like we didn't tell you last week. One of the Emperor's Angels of Death, a Space Marine. That's right. We painted our first Space Marine. It took us three whole episodes to get here. Yeah, I've never painted a Space Marine before. So this was my first time. I know. I find that bizarre. I know. Isn't, isn't that wild? Even just like, I mean, you know, I play Chaos. Yeah, if you play uh a faction called Chaos, Chaos Space, Space Marine. Marines. Yeah, yep. never took the time to paint any of them. Mm -hmm. The only one I painted was uh, Fabius, who's, I mean, he is at one point a Space Marine, I guess. Yeah, but he's kind of a Space Marine. He's more Dr. Frankenstein. He's more Frankenstein. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. He doesn't paint like a no. Space Marine. I can tell you that definitively. I just painted a Space Marine. He he doesn't even paint really like a uh, an Emperor's Children Space Marine, really. No, yeah, he's... He's very his much own his own deal. thing. Yeah. Uh, besides that, then the ripped up ultramarine on the end of a demon prince cloth, yes. which again was like a coat of contrast paint once. Like that was <laughs> yeah. not just slap chop it, throw some speed paint blue over him, and call yeah, that's exactly it. With that, I just did like a zenithal. I threw on a. I think it was actually a proper contrast, mm -hmm. not a uh, speed paint. But I think I did a coat, mm -hmm. and then hit the gold, and then it was like, all right but all of this gore effect over the top of it. So even then I had a hard sculpting in the gore. Mm -hmm. So when it came time to paint the Marine, there wasn't even that much Marine to paint. Right. It was mostly glooped on gore. So yeah. really didn't count. He was a fine red soup on the end of your mighty demon prince's claws. Maybe we should include that picture with this episode, actually, just so people know how much I really had not painted a proper Space Marine before. Yeah, and we'll post that by uh, my entire army of Ultra Smurfs. Well, I told you, I actually made it a Ultramarine as like a little homage to you. Oh, thanks, man. What I started doing is as I was making more like kit bashing different things and hand mm -hmm. sculpting different things to try to pull off a few different demon princes. So I'd have like one of Corn, one of Slanesh, blah, blah, blah. I started trying to... Uh, Basically, all of my friends that I play Warhammer with mm -hmm. have a dead miniature from their army in the scene with each demon prince. Eh. So this kit bash I was doing of uh, some different 3D files was like a Slanesh looking demon prince or demon prince, but I did as a demon princess. And then I had her flying and landing on a uh, Imperial Guardsman. And I even did like through an STLs and stuff of like intestines just being ripped out of his torso and everything. But one of my other buddies that I play with is a guard mm -hmm. player. So I was even going to like replicate his paint job over there mm -hmm. for the Nurgle one I was doing. One of my other buddies I play with is a 
Tau player, so I was going to do a dead Tau over on his guy. And I was mm-hmm. thinking about doing, like, basically have the armor kind of scattered across the base, and then have, like, mushrooms and rot and stuff growing out of there. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. And then my other buddy's a Thousand Suns player, so that was, you know, just, it was already kind of related to him. <laughs> I didn't need to do anything. Yeah, you were just like, eh, it's a Zinch one. It's an homage. Yeah. I actually didn't even put one together. I, yeah. I'm not a huge psychic powers guy. Uh, yeah, well, we will see to kind of timestamp this episode. We're getting uh, a lot of information about the new edition of 40K. Yeah. Uh, kind of around with when this is coming out. So, um, yeah, well, it'll be interesting. My personal take is that Space Marines getting condensed is a good thing for game design. Yep. And uh, you can still paint them and play them however you want. Lore wise, it makes more sense that their differences come across in fighting styles, not just them getting different faction wide buffs. I'm going to be interested to see how they do this. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, if you had asked me a year ago, I would have been against the changes. Uh Uh-huh. I might have alluded to this when we were talking about the Gold Dragon. I was a 3-5 and Pathfinder guy forever for my tabletop RPGs. And uh, I'd done like one one shot in 5th edition and totally hated it Mm -hmm. for 5e D&D. And I was like, oh, it's too simple. It's too stripped down. You can't do anything. You can't blah, blah, blah. And I bitched and I complained until eventually my buddy convinced me, hey, do this 5e one shot with me. I said, all right, fine. And I fell in love right away. And now I play three 5e games. Mm-hmm. all within like a month of that not first introduction but second introduction to 5e and i was like oh i was wrong actually this game is better in almost every way and i love it mm-hmm. and i'm hoping that 10th edition 40k is going to be the same thing where yeah things are stripped down and more simple great it actually allows me to play the game a bit more yes and once further attracts new players to the hobby because i'll tell you even with you kind of coaching me getting me into 40k i still don't understand it very well it's so hard I started coaching you in 8th edition, right? No, 9 no. 9 was out. Not every not every faction had a 9th book. But you were you started with the 9th edition 8th edition CSM codex. Yes, yeah, you yeah. were running 9th edition Marines, I was running 8th edition Chaos Space Marines. And in our 500 point game, I got spanked so hard I think the game was over before the end of the second turn. Yeah. Yeah, um, hopefully Combat Patrol, the supposed answer to 500 points that you will play out of one box. Also, Loki, uh, this exactly timestamps the day. We might be getting a new faction in the indexes on launch called Imperial Agents. Oh, good. Actually, no, that sounded sarcastic. I realized that in my tone. Yeah. But from another podcast I was listening to, because I'm not completely up to date on mm-hmm. on lore, it, there's a lot of it. Yeah, there is a lot. Of Imperial it. Agents, they sounded really cool and yeah. like their own faction. Yeah. And like there's they have a really unique and important place within Imperial power. Mm-hmm. But I, yeah, I, I didn't think they were really represented many places. I did just see something the other day that Sisters of Silence are going to get some stuff. I would not be surprised because at this point we have so many uh, like not old and shitty Inquisitor models and there's apparently a whole new kill team coming out that is Imperial Inquisition. So that's got a bunch of like cool Inquisition stuff. And then there was the Adeptus Arbides, which is basically a bunch of Judge Dread looking motherfuckers. We had the Imperial Navy Auxilia. We had the Voidsmen at Arms from the Rogue Trader stuff. So, like, there are enough kits where if you give them some rhinos, you let them take, like, a Valkyrie or something, you could definitely draw stuff from enough armies that they aren't just literally, like, an Inquisitor and some Custodes or an Inquisitor and some Grey Knights. You could potentially put together a codex now of non-ass looking models. So if that is a thing, cool. If they're just going to be a more active role as allies for Imperial factions, I'm 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 actually less excited about that because from a game design perspective, I like when 
my flavors are kind of separated. Chaos is the mm-hmm. one thing I kind of like mixing with itself. Yeah, you like a little chaos soup. Yeah, because it's chaos. Let's let's throw some chaos in there. But with how often the imp- <laughs> the Imperials are fucking murdering each other, I am more likely to believe the forces of chaos working together than them. Yeah, I'm interested. I I don't know. I. I'm going to re- hold all reservation or all judgment until we actually start to see some gameplay. Yeah. The good thing will be day one, when the edition launches, all the indexes will be out there. And thank goodness. Yeah. You've heard me rant, rave, and complain about rolling codexes. Yeah. Well, that was just it. So like we were just saying, when you were teaching me to play, I was stuck with 8th edition Chaos Marines versus your ninth edition Marines. Yeah. So I got slaughtered. We were playing one wound Chaos Marines against two wound Primaris Marines. It was kind of silly. God, you might have even given me two wounds to be nice and it still didn't matter. Yeah. I have to imagine you did, knowing that you were like, hey, TJ, I'm going to teach you how to play Warhammer. You haven't touched it in 14 years. And I was like, okay. Yep. So there was that, but then like, okay, so I waited the better part of a year for my Chaos Codex to come out. Mm -hmm. Chaos was too strong right out of the gate. It was pretty stupid. And I was playing Creations of Bile, which until 9th edition, I swear to God, nobody had ever heard of. No, it was in a book with Custodes and Death Guard? rules expansions yeah but nobody had ever heard of it i'd like showed up to local tournaments didn't even play but people were like oh what armies are you and i was like oh creations of bio and they're like what the hell is that yeah so nobody had ever heard of it all of a sudden they were super strong in getting tournament play Mm -hmm. but then less than three months after the book came out nothing from my 60 dollar book was true anymore yeah and i've also always hated like the you know Oh, and then suddenly everybody has armor of contempt. And if you don't know about it, it doesn't show up in a book anywhere. And like, oh, actually, we just got rid of it for the latest. uh, Yeah, it's gone now. And you just had to know about it. So like technically, by the time I was playing with my uh, Imperial Guard friend, I no longer had armor of contempt. But we didn't know that. Didn't really matter. We were still playing mission packs from the season before. But tournament wise, if I had showed up to a tournament that day, I didn't know that. Yeah. And that's why I really like this new online release thing that they're doing, because at least if I understand correctly, they're going to be putting out those data cards or those indexes. And whether they're adding or removing Armor of Contempt, it's going to say it right there and then every time. Yes. And that's going to be so important because it's just too damn confusing, man. Also, having codexes, I think, are going to move towards a list of data sheets Well, they might not even be data sheets. Those might still come out for free. I don't know. I hope data sheets are all free index stuff and your codexes are mostly fun fluff. I want them to just be detachments and crusade rules. It it sounds like they have massively overhauled the secondary system yet again. And that I think is probably good. Yeah. At the end of the day, what I'm really looking forward to is I think this is going to all ultimately lead to a more balanced Warhammer experience. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I've just always hated is that the game is just so unbalanced for Mm -hmm. what is supposed to be a fairly competitive game. If this was 20 minute matches and there were no stakes, then sure, who cares? But there's a tournament going on at your friendly local store every other weekend and there's real money involved. Mm -hmm. And besides that, the games last hours and I really don't want to spend two hours getting spanked because somebody didn't play test well enough or worse yet they intentionally designed things in a way so that when the new army comes out it's the soup du jour and everybody goes and purchases all the models so they can get three months of free tournament wins yeah which is honestly you know my conspiratorial mind here i think what was happening was very intentional Mm -hmm. my business school mind says I mean, if I was running a business and I was trying to maximize profits, that's sure what I would consider yeah. doing. It's just like the deal with Watsy. I, I yes, think exactly. if I'm Games Workshop, I look at Watsy and I go, we are growing. Watsy mm-hmm. is shoveling goodwill into the furnace of profits. And yep. I don't know how sustainable that model is. 
And Games Workshop can probably also look to other competitors in the past who put out release schedules that were, quite frankly, breakneck. Mm -hmm. And that is what Wizards also did. And I think kind of slowing your roll, making the game fun, yep. and trying to maintain that balance of casual slash narrative play along with their more competitive minded audience and the hobby angle, which I think is important distinction over something like magic. Yeah. To, to kind of bounce off what you're saying there, you're right. The we've recently seen wizards of the coast losing goodwill time after time after time between D and D and yeah. Magic the gathering. I mean, the most goodwill I've felt towards them is probably shadow of the dragon queen. It's a really well-written novel module. Like it's really good, mm -hmm. but uh, that still does not make, I, I don't follow the, the D and D related blunders. I feel like they're still really recovering from everything that was going on with the open games license. Yeah. That was a uh, big, dumb, stupid move. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pretty catastrophic. And, you know, even D and D products have been coming out at such a breakneck pace. There've been some really good analyses on that saying, Hey, we used to get half as many books, and each of these books had three or four times as much useful content. And now we're getting more books that are less useful. And that was really rubbing a lot of the community the wrong way. And I, I don't see them slowing. And frankly, I'm seeing that in current Magic the Gathering stuff. So for example, there's a story that's really been breaking over this last week here mm -hmm. with a uh, YouTuber who got his hands on a box of not March of the Machines, but March of the Machines, whatever it is, like expanded, excellent. I don't, I don't know. Apparently it's basically the same, like March of the Machines just came out a month ago. Mm -hmm. And now we've already got this second March of the Machines product. And I mean that right there, they have the same name. And then it led to this whole nightmare where apparently they had sent private Pinkerton agents to this YouTuber's house because he got his hands on these boxes before they were supposed to be released by about two, three weeks. And he started opening them and putting those videos on YouTube. And uh, so they sent private agents to his home to. He's used very guarded language. So to honor what the actual creator has said and not getting too into what everyone else has said about the situation. He said that they, you know, started talking about, jail and lawsuits and theft and scared his wife he also described the people who showed up as quote heavy hitters so whatever all of that means to you is what it means to you what it means to me is they used a private security firm to intimidate him and it does not seem like he purchased stolen goods it seems like he purchased goods that whoever sold them to him accidentally like whatever the distributor was yeah. just didn't know what they were doing yeah and then he went oh shit the new do you we found out about primaris dante because someone ordered dante and accidentally got new dante and was like hmm and put that on the internet that is not something i would threaten someone with violence over it seems like a extreme reaction yeah so i mean in this month right now so this is may 2023 and folks are calling for a whole new round of boycotts against watsi yeah. mm. and i don't think it's actually going to take especially because you don't have as good of a uh i guess a linchpin and like a live like a live metric by which to measure your boycott like you did with D, &D beyond because ultimately D, D beyond was something that directly hit wizards checking count whereas magic the gathering if you're boycotting magic you're going to be hitting your local game stores checking account yeah so it's interesting the boycott called for like an all-out nobody do anything for one month and it was actually really explicit in saying one month one month of no friday night magic no mtg arena this that whatever i don't see that going anywhere and i do see that being really detrimental to your friendly local game store there could be a real argument of perhaps nobody do the online or Hey, everybody, only purchase singles this month. Don't buy new packs. Not saying to do that or not to do that. I don't personally have a horse in this race. I don't even really play MTG anymore. Yeah, I have not in years. 
I don't want to editorialize on what other people are doing as much as just report on uh, this is stuff that I've heard going on today. Mm. And all of that to bring it back to Warhammer. What I like is this to me feels like Games Workshop doing something for customer goodwill for the oh, first yes. time in a long time. The Age of Darkness box is a true champion of the people. Yes. The plastic Land Raider Spartan is the people's Land Raider. Hell yes. Absolutely. I think the start collecting boxes, then into the Age of Darkness box, which is again very relevant to our episode today. Yes, we which swear. Uh, I swear at some point we'll even officially start the episode. Yeah. We might, but we're not there point. yet. I'm not doing it no. yet. Nope. Mm -mm. Right now I'm still in rant and rave mode. And then this, where, you know what, especially a couple months ago, we were hit with, hey, they're going to be increasing prices of models. And everyone was pretty pissed off. And I get that. Nobody likes paying more money for your plastic. Mm -hmm. But if the exchange is, the models will cost a little bit more. You don't have to pay for rules to play the game. I'm willing to pay more for the models. Pog -ers. And yeah. once further, with a game that's inherently balanced, instead of me every three months needing to update with a new army to be competitive. Yeah. Instead, if the game is balanced, well, now I feel incentivized to play more armies. I do want to say more balanced. I'm never going to expect complete and total balance. Sure. I mean, look, you know, so even if we go to video games and we're looking at real time strategy games. Yeah, RTS is I think League is probably my gold standard for balance. And see, I go to Dota. Yeah, League and Dota are probably the two best examples, in my opinion. And so this, it, well, I think this is a great way to break it down. This is what I was looking at with the uh, Warhammer example. So League, when they release a new champion, the new champion is usually overtooled. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, again, intentional design because you want people to spend resources on purchasing the new champion right out of the gate. What I like about the Dota model is when you download Dota, you have every character forever. Mm -hmm. There is no unlock the champion. So not only is there no incentive to like, oh, you have to play the new champion unless you think they're interesting, but there's also no reason not to play other characters because any character right. at any time can be really good or really bad. And they're more incentivized to make a more balanced game, mm -hmm. which is for me, the parallel of these indexes. There is less incentive to make an overpowered army. So instead with all the armies getting their rules updated in real time, released at the same time, etc. Now, for me, I go, well, I already have 2,000 points of chaos, I enjoy playing them, and I don't have to wait for a big codex or for a big power creep to then say, you know, but I also really want to try playing Tau or Necrons. Right. If I know that out of the gate, this new box of Necrons that I put together is going to be about as strong as a new box of chaos, well, maybe I'm going to feel a little better about trying a, a little Necron mm -hmm. Battle Force. Yeah. Or Combat Patrol or whatever they call them. I'll be real. My Ultramarines past a certain point in 9th edition sat on a shelf for a long time. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't want to just say they were Iron Hands. I know that's fine. And under the new rules, I don't have to worry about that. Because you could just play them in a detachment that favors armor. So the Iron Hands might favor that detachment, but there's nothing saying the Ultramarines don't ever field mass armor companies either. So, yeah, a lot of a lot of really interesting stuff in that regard. I'm really excited for this new age of darkness. Yes. Eh? This new age of darkness. Yep. Another system I could go on about because I like the stuff they're doing over there in uh, Heresy Land. But to get back to it, let's uh, let's start the Small Talk podcast. Yeah, let's let's formally intro this episode. Yeah. Welcome. You're finally here. I know. After uh, 25 I'm, minutes. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, our our producer, who is my anthropomorphized uh, hobby knife, is threatening me with his head to begin the uh, beginning of episode copy. So I will. I'm Cannon. I'm TJ. And this is the Small Talk Podcast, where we, I guess, where we talk about miniatures. But if this is your first episode, you could be forgiven for thinking that we're just bitter Magic fans. Yeah, that we're just MTG fans or Warhammer yeah. fans. And I think that's a lot of the fun of our show. It's not just a show about painting, but it's about having just conversations about what these models make mm -hmm. us think about our experiences painting them is of course part of that but just yeah. anything related to it you know when we talked about our gold dragons we talked about the model itself we talked about aragorn and watching movies we talked about all I sorts do, of different things. i have it correct you every time you've mentioned Christopher I know I do Paolini's it. Aragorn I, know, novels, I, I know i do it every time I, you bring up uh, vigo mortensen and uh his anguished broken foot scream yeah yeah, no, I, uh, I, I've I, done that my entire life. I know it's wrong. <laughs> I will never be able to fix it. I've tried so <laughs> many times. Fair I, enough. It's, it's programmed. I've tried. Well, I will say, as much as I like those books, I loved them when I was younger. I'm rereading them right now. Mr. Aragorn, probably a little bit of a larger cultural impact. Probably. Nerdum. Probably. I think that it's a toss up, but <laughs> yeah, but it, the point here is, uh, folks, listeners, whoever you are out there, yeah. um, we don't want to just sit here and talk to you about painting the miniatures because there are so many amazing painters out there. And if you've mm -hmm. stumbled here, that means you probably already check out some great painters. And yeah. while we would do our best, we just want to talk about the models, how they make us feel, things they make us think about and just kind of chat. Do you want to know what this model made me think about? What was that? If you thought I wasn't a nerd already, who boy, am I about to dissuade you of that notion? TJ, have you ever heard of something called the Bad Ab War? Uh, yes, I have. We've talked about it a lot recently. Yeah. But I don't know a ton about it. It was a uh, like sixth edition ish era. Yeah. Like a sixth edition, like 2010, 2011 campaign setting. So these days, Warhammer does a lot of like campaign books right like in seventh edition like when the tau came out there was like the damocles gulf campaign they've done stuff like that the war for armageddon the 13th black crusade all that stuff but this one was interesting because the stars were it was basically what if we did horus heresy but like teeny and like out of the way with 90 percent ultramarine successor chapters now, you may be thinking, canon, that doesn't sound very interesting. <laughs> and well, unfortunately, there's not a lot of like Black Library stuff tied to Bad Ab. It's mainly just two big old Forge World Imperial Armor campaign books that are like $300 of a copy if you want to buy them physically. <laughs> but it's a really interesting little internecine conflict that unfortunately ends with the guys being like, oh, and it was chaos all along, which is kind of boring. But what's not boring is it never turns into a big imperial versus chaos conflict. It's pretty much a civil war. And the only people that ever really fall to chaos are uh, you might know him as Huron Blackheart of the Red Corsairs of the Black Legion using that one stratagem to turn themselves into Black Corsairs so they can advance in charge in Ninth edition. Fame, that's about the extent of their fame. I'm sorry, but don't worry, Red Corsairs slash Astral Claws players. I have brought you something even more obscure than your faved chapter. TJ, I'm going to send you the picture of our glorious quote unquote Mark Six Space Marine that I painted for the uh for today's or this week's rather podcast. Yeah, you really struggled to get that last little bit. Out. I did. I time is a flat circle. I'm guessing you're trying to multitask right there. I was taking pictures. Yeah. Like a taking pictures. You didn't already take yours? I did. I just always take new ones. I did. Okay. Yeah. 
So I was Ooh. in, I was just like, I'm going weirdo mode. I went back to an old, oh gosh, uh, I think it's a goon hammer mission pack from it's set on fighting in the Badab War, and it has some like bespoke rules for like different characters that weren't in the Forge World books. Sorry, you said Goonhammer as in like the content creator? Yes. Yes. Was it like an official or just like something of theirs? I don't recall because I had to delete it to make room for recording video on my phone recently. I would maybe be able to track it down. I'll post it in the show notes if I find it before we uh, publish. But it was this wild paint scheme that is bright orangish yellow covered in goofy looking tiger camouflage. Yeah. And a white shoulder pad. And it's not clear if this is the Astral Claws who are assumed to be Ultramarine successors, but it's not known. They allegedly had a parent chapter called the Tiger Claws. Sick. So they're like successors. So the Astral Claws are like successor, successor chapters. And their parent chapter, which originally defended this area that the, the Astral Claws were tasked with defending called the Maelstrom Zone, which is where the Bad Ab War takes place. Their predecessors were from here and mysteriously disappeared. So then a couple hundred years later, the High Lords of Terra assign them and a couple other Space Marine chapters to defending this frontier region closer to the galactic core that's filled with warp storms, but also a lot of like vital, not raw, raw, eh, raw materials and natural resources for uh, the Imperium's giant wasteful wars. And these Tiger Claws, I guess at some point, pop out of a warp storm and are quote unquote reunited with the Astral Claws. However, it's unknown what happened to their remaining number. So they're a really mysterious chapter and they're mentioned in like two lines of fluff but they have a hilarious color scheme that combined with the blue dirt base I put him on top of, I think gives a really wild, very cartoony look, kind of reminiscent of when Space Marines were just, they were doing a lot, man, <laughs> like with their armor. So since you've now explained to me what it is that I'm looking at, I'm also tabbing over and looking at different images online. And I, a hundred percent, as you were talking, I was like, this is weird enough. This might just be purely a goon hammer thing, but no, you, this is a, this is a real thing. These are real guys. They're in the Imperial armor books, but they're like a passing reference. They do not get a color plate. They do not. Yeah, it's just like maybe these guys were the parent chapter of the Astral Claws. No one really knows. And maybe they were like what corrupted the Astral Claws when they popped out of the. Can yeah, I, no one I'm knows. A, at least when I'm over here on 40K Wiki, there are a few things here. So, one, there's like one paint scheme not very similar to yours, there's one that's pretty darn similar to yours. But. I think this might be a real image of original first edition chapter badge of the tiger claws. Oh. So I think these guys are, are oh, like old hammer. These guys are original gangsters. Yeah. Old future hammer. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I did. I want to say these are our first miniatures we've had to build for the podcast. This is something that was not a talking point in our previous episodes because those models come they pop out of the box and they're ready to paint yeah those of you familiar with gw kits know that is not the case for any gw kit no well i will say i probably well i struggled a little bit to put together my marine for mm -hmm. various reasons i still feel like i spent more time trying to make the gold dragon work than i did putting together fair my, my pre-assembled gold dragon was harder to make work than my uh than my space marine 
Yeah, that was a that was a model. But it, this episode's not about that. But this is about our space marines. TJ, before we kind of get into like what we did into nitty gritty or how we feel on the model, what did you do with your space marine, your Mark Six marine? Yeah. Yeah, so for my Mark VI Marine, I really wanted to make a good guy. In 40k, I don't have a lot of good guys. I was a Chaos player that I still have my Chaos, and I will likely start playing again soon. And I've been uh, starting to put together a bunch of nasty old space bugs, which I'm really excited to... I've got some goofy ideas. The Zerg. Uh, shit. Uh, the bugs. No, that's not right. God damn it. The that's Tyranids. the ones. Right. Yeah, so uh, I like painting monsters and tyranids have always been the army mm -hmm. i wanted to paint uh i was putting off playing tyranids actually because one of my buddies already played them and i was like oh i don't want to step on anybody's toes here but i haven't played warhammer with him ever uh and i just decided you know what not playing for the off chance that maybe someday i play with him is not a reason not to have the army i want so uh -huh. i've got my very evil chaos i've got my somewhere between evil and neutral space bugs Oh, they're just hungry. Got That's what I'm saying. I call them. I, I think I made that argument last episode. Yeah, I think we talked about that briefly. Yeah. So I wanted some good guys. And really, in my estimation, there are two chapters or chapter and two chapters of space. Sub fact. Yeah. Chapter, yeah. sub chapter, whatever you want to call they are them. chapters. They're both chapters. For me, it would either be salamanders or lamenters and the lamenters are my favorite space marines. yeah i but... think lamenters are the coolest but i don't believe that they're actually 30k accurate they come right after 30k if i yes, recall yes they are part of the 21st founding don't get me started on the lamenters rant we will be here all day yeah i don't understand any of it i don't get yeah you know your warhammer lore i really don't uh, maybe once maybe when we paint when, when we get around to another space marine i'll do him as a lamenter so we can have that rant i yeah i'd love to talk about lamenters a bit more because i think they're so cool and they're nice and also i like ska and they're like ska patterned so that's cool <laughs> <laughs> i'd never even thought about that yeah they're the best they're they're everything that i like in this world they're ska and good guys and that's great but anyway salamanders are the other guys that i'm like they're pretty much the goodest guys in warhammer that are at least a major player mm -hmm. so i wanted to i wanted to play some good guys i want somebody that doesn't make me feel bad for liking them the sons of vulcan himself exactly and on top of that i like lizards and dragons so it was perfect yeah and i like you know fire's cool yeah so just it everything about it it totally worked for me so i went for a just good old-fashioned salamander that being said i don't really like just how dark the salamander paint scheme is especially in 30k they're a little too dark so i really wanted to push saturation and contrast and try to make something really bright and on top of that i've been trying to learn edge highlighting mm -hmm. and i went to the nines on this guy i gotta yeah. say well this isn't my favorite model that i have i'd still say my demon prince is my favorite model this is i think technically the best paint job i have probably ever put out i'm so mm -hmm. happy with this guy yeah and yeah i don't have as much to say about 40k conversation as you do when it comes to the actual lore stuff but I like fire and good guys. I love his look. Thank you. Before I we kind of get into like technicals on painting, I kind of want to talk a little bit about this kit. Sure. Yeah. Because when I got into Warhammer 40,000, it was after the advent of 8th edition, which is where we started to see Primaris Marines, which are updated size scale they're essentially true scale marines older marines were a little squat for yep. what space marines are described as in universe yeah essentially a space marine model was about the same size as an imperial guard model yeah and that made people go hey that's not right and then games workshop was like "Ooh, a chance to yes. make a new miniature uh and i agree with the decision yeah they they look pretty good the lore behind primaris marines totally stinks it's gotten better has it, it? it yes okay. if you just read blood of ball i get it it's yeah it's a little it's a little one note in blood of ball 
But if you read like the Plague Wars novels or um, I've actually heard good things about the new Dawn of Fire books. Okay. I do think while clumsy, the retrofitting of Primaris Marines is interesting. Okay, fair. Yeah, fair. Yeah. I don't know enough when it comes to these like lore conversations to really weigh in. I am the Lorax on this podcast, but let me be clear. That does not mean I am uh, Adeptus Ridiculous. Okay, like I'm not Bricky. I, I I I do not, you know, regularly do 40k book clubs. I know what I know from a couple novels I've read, my mimetic learning of stuff, and wiki dives I've gone into on stuff I find interesting. Fair. Yeah. I uh yeah, I I think most of what I know about 40k lore is from talking with you. I uh I don't think I've ever read a 40k book. I think it's fun to get lost in 40k wiki and listen to people talk about it. But Mm -hmm. frankly, I don't, I like reading. I don't read often enough. And when I do read it's, I think it would be hard for me to put the time into a 40k (laughs) novel compared to just some other things that I'm reading. Read the infinite and the divine. It's really good. Yeah. I think so right now I was telling you this earlier, I'm reading some dorky philosophy books right now. And then, Uh immediately when i finish that uh i'm gonna go read name of the wind which those are supposed to be just phenomenal and i've actually heard the author on of all things like a Shadowrun actual play podcast uh which was really fun it's like my mom's favorite book series and i got them for her just kind of on a whim one year for like a birthday or or mother's day or something i was like oh what's some popular new fantasy stuff coming out right picked them up and she's like read them until they fell apart and then bought more copies and read them until they (laughs) fell apart and they haven't been around that long. They still haven't even put out the third book yet. She oh, just wow. rereads them that often. Wow. So I went over to my local Half Price Books and found a couple copies and need to actually read those. Yeah. We got, we've got spring and summer, so now I will. I like reading outside. I don't like reading inside. I don't know why. Yeah, and it's definitely nicer to read outside on the, on the west side um, than it is over here. It can get quite blisteringly hot. These episodes have all been recorded uh, during the saga of my air conditioner not working. So I'm a very sweaty boy. Yeah. Rest in peace. Yep. I just like the sun a lot. And we live in an area where I don't get sun ever. And so I like to read outside and get a little yeah. a little wind on my arms. It's nice. <laughs> yeah. I lost track of what we were saying. Well, we were talking about the Mark VI kit before yeah. we had a, our aside yeah that's right so yeah both of us or at least i know for me my mark six kit was the one included in the age of darkness box as was mine okay so you didn't go out and purchase an additional i did not i still had one five man sprue left so tell me a little bit about the weapons that you have there because i sure didn't see those on my kit well well i i did what's called a bit of a kit bash so i was a bit naughty TJ built something very like he had some some bits he 3D printed. Yep. Yeah, that should be out in the open. Yes. Uh, I did a 3D printed helmet and shoulder. I didn't want to go any further than that. We both mm-hmm. kind of decided a little bit of bits that are, you know, if if yeah. we're kind of going by Games Workshop rules of what is it like, like 10 percent or 30 yeah, percent or something. 90 percent GW plastic is the. Rule, yeah. I think. So ultimately, I wanted my guy to be as per the rules as i could off the sprue the exception was the helmet and the shoulder because Mm -hmm. i liked both of those upgrade kits and i might end up purchasing those in the future but for the time being that would be 50 dollars for me to end up using one shoulder and one helmet for the purposes of this episode yeah if i get super into 30k and super into salamanders will i make that financial investment sure absolutely yeah Yeah. but not (laughs) Not for this one episode right now. And yes. then have nine of each that I'm not using. Yeah. So I had some old Mark IV and Mark III bits, uh, which are other Horus Heresy adjacent Space Marine parts lying around. And because my Space Marine is from the Tiger Claws, I thought, well, 
seeing as guns are for nerds, I'm going to give this guy two lightning claws. And the Mark VI kit is interesting in that everyone in the uh, Mark VI kit, who is a character, is a left-handed shot. So all their melee weapons are on their right hand. This is in stark contrast to the Mark IV, Mark VII, and Mark III kits, which all have power swords, lightning claws, power fists, power mauls, power axes, your implements of violence du jour clasped firmly in their left hand. And it varies more on Primaris models. But uh, yeah, so these older armor mark kits for the heresy have this difference. So I was very easily able to take the lightning claw from the Mark VI Sergeant upgrade sprue that you get a bunch of with the Age of Darkness box and build a lightning claw and then put a Mark III power claw on his left hand and give him two lightning claws, which makes him a uh, very, very... uh, he gives people really mean high fives. That's his his deal. You don't want to be giving this guy high fives. Yeah, I think it's interesting because I agree with you that guns are for nerds. But have you ever considered putting a knife on the end of your gun? That's true. That is what you did. You yeah. split the difference. Yeah, I split the difference. Uh, so I wanted something kind of stock standard that could really be used as a template for uh, assuming that I get really into salamanders at some point. Yeah, like this, your legionaries, all your tactical marines could look like yep. this. Yep. Absolutely. And that's really what we were going for here. Even their backpack within this kit has a little extra tab on the top of it that you can either cut off or you can start putting various accoutrements on there as far as different things mm-hmm. on their hip for purity seals or this, that, whatever. I just wanted none of that. Let's mm-hmm. just take this as plain Jane, simple. This guy wouldn't stand out on my table, but I think he's a vibrant enough paint job. He'd stand out on most tables because mm-hmm. in the grim dark future, you don't nor you normally don't get this bright of a green. No. Yeah. I really wanted something that was otherwise unremarkable. It is just a space Marine. Mm-hmm. It is just a guy with a gun. Who's kind of big has a couple too many organs and uh, he's going to go kill his evil brothers. Yes. Yeah, he is ready to uh, doom slayer his way off Istvan and get revenge on those rat bastards yep. uh, in the third legion, Fulgrim, Angron, and uh, oh God, now I'm showing my ass. I don't remember the third one. I think it's Mortarian. I think it's sure. Guard. Sure. Why not? Yeah, I I, uh, I couldn't tell you. I don't know. No. At one point in time, I might have. I was going through a lore phase about a year ago, but I've dropped off. That's why there's so few salamanders, is because most of them die during the heresy. Yes. Yeah, I did know that. Yeah, both them and the Space Wolves have this thing of they only recruit people from their home planet. Yeah. So there's like barely any of them. <laughs> Unlike the Space Wolves, they're cool. <laughs> oh shots fired shots fired uh yeah i i used to like space wolves more as they got more wolf and less viking i like them less i i feel like space wolf players would sympathize with you on that I, yeah i think most space wolf players do sympathize yeah. with that i know one of my buddies who he's been playing space pups since we were kids he's completely switched off of them and started playing voton because he doesn't like how wolfy they are it's just too much for him Meanwhile, I'll tell you, if they got a little more lizardy and a little more dragony with my uh, salamanders, I'd be into it. That's true. Unfortunately, they are a very Codex compliant chapter. So, because they're good boys. They are good boys. Don't you forget it. Yeah, as far as the sprues, though, so I'll say something that I thought was interesting putting this together. One, yes. that left shoulder that's got all those like oversized rivets, I'm sure there's some lore name for whatever Molecular those are. Molecular bonding studs cool uh, <laughs> i thought it was interesting that that shoulder is two pieces that you put together i've never seen another shoulder like have that. you seen the old molecular bonding stud shoulders no i they hate come them. in one pieces yes because instead of a instead of a perfect circle there are these weird oblong oval things 
They, oh, they don't even look with these right. being kind of your perfect circle. I did not intend on using Mark VI shoulders at all. Uh-huh. Uh, in my last moment, I decided to keep with that Mark VI shoulder, and then my 3D printed one, I believe, is either a Mark II or Mark III era. Yeah, those are similar. Yeah, Mark II or Mark III. The, the Mark VI ones that I found out there weren't close enough to the Forge World ones. Uh-huh. Meanwhile, they were usually like they didn't have any sort of edge anything going on, and I don't like them when they're entirely smooth. There just wasn't anything interesting. It was like a, it was just a shoulder with the salamander logo and nothing else. And I was like, eh, I just didn't feel like that looked as. Yeah, they're master artisans. Like they maintain their own armor, their own weapons. And there was just nothing on there that looked particularly interesting. And at the end of the day, I wanted something fun to paint. I wanted something to test myself because I really wanted to push, push my limits practice my edge highlighting my fine detail work with like hitting those individual rivets etc right right the one note i'll really make about this is as a guy who's never put together space marines before in the even the chaos marines that i put together they were from like a start collecting box i really don't have tac you know, whatever they're called legionaries or tacticals yeah, yeah like the whatever the tacticals are for chaos i suck with names uh, I don't really run a lot of those guys. I've run a lot of guys that use a lot of one-handed weapons, not these two-handed weapons. Yeah, these things called guns, because let us reiterate, they are for nerds. Which gets me to, I've never had to deal with the absolute freaking nightmare of having my gun be attached to my hands, which are not attached to my arms, and trying to get that whole thing put together using <laughs> plastic glue instead of super glue. I see. This was a struggle that ended up working out to my advantage, which is when it came time for me to do my painting, my priming, really, my arms fell off. Or no, it wasn't even the arms. I think it was just the gun. Yeah, it was just the gun fell off, which I ended up being really thankful for. When it fell off, I almost went back to attach it. And then I realized how much more access to the chest and yeah. inner arms I got for that. So I ended up actually just grabbing my little hobby drill putting a small hole in the hand and then pinning that to a paper clip and using that paper clip to do all of my priming. Now you're thinking with portals. It was great. Uh, I painted the entire gun using that. Yeah, the gun, I will say, looks dope. Thank I you. have not seen that scheme before. How did you do it? So that was so fun for me, right? With this scheme, I came into it with the idea that a lot of the things I see online, especially nowadays for the Salamander scheme, they don't use the orange very much. And especially in the Heresy era, it's mm. a lot of the green and black. Yeah. I didn't want to do that. Like I said, I wanted something striking. I wanted something fairly saturated. And I love the contrast of orange and green. Mm -hmm. So in order to really play with that, from the very first step, what I did was a Xenophil Prime. But instead of doing your traditional black and white Zenithal, I did black and yellow, mm, which is how I achieved 90% of what makes this model look so good, is I simply went, hey, we're looking at colors. What color lies in common with both green and orange? It's yellow. So that started everything for this model, starting with that that under I, what what do you call that like undertone highlighting or under under highlighting whatever pre -shading, it is pre-shading whatever it is made a, a world of difference mm -hmm. then i came through and with the airbrush hit a thin coat of some green to start building up and playing with those highlights notably i did not use any contrast paints this was all traditional paints nice but yeah so really starting with that yellow tone was super important mm-hmm from there, I went, okay, I've already established all of my under my my undertones, everything. Again, I'm so bad with these names uh, of the different techniques. I watch videos and then I don't, I interpret what they did, not what they called it. Right. I sat around with the model and I did all of my edge highlighting for absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> the big error I made is I did edge highlighting for the entire model while this thing was still green. I wasn't thinking about the fact that I was going to come back through and do something uh. black or orange or metallic or whatever. So I took all that time and like did my backpack with green on green, the places where you can't see them as well in the photos here, but those mm -hmm. kind of like a back of the knee, metallic black areas, things like yeah. that. So I had to go back over those with black. But 
it all came down to this idea again of what colors are universal across this model. So the final orange tone you see, especially like on the salamander emblem itself, Mm -hmm. that is army painter lava orange. And I made it a point to no matter what color I was using after the greens, always mix at least one drop of that orange into the color. That's that's a good way to tie the model together. Yeah. So the blacks and grays that you see here are actually one part Vallejo black to three parts army painter lava orange when it came to getting those colors a little bit brighter then i would either use a vallejo white or there were a couple different grays different things that i played with and again i always had just a little itty bitty bit of that lava orange in there so the gun is vallejo black with lava orange then highlighted with i wish i could remember the gray but it was a gray with some of that orange and then a few key spots i think i ended up using it was either the Vallejo white or... No, it wasn't the white. It was actually just a lighter gray, off-white, almost like... I think they call it mummy robes or something like that. Gotcha. And again, just a teeny little bit of that orange in there. The mixes were between one to three, like one part orange to three parts something else, or one part something else to three parts orange. Those were kind of the the, the standards that I used. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so that's that's really how I achieved what this model does everything in it even the the browns when you come over to the leather pouch or the scrolls those also have some of that orange in there yeah i can really see that yeah i think it's especially visible on the gun and on the edge highlights on that pistol uh, holster yeah yep yes that was that was what i did there and uh i gotta tell you canon i'm going to do that every single time for the rest of these salamanders as I make more of them, or really anytime I, I think when I look at army wide things is right. I'm probably going to lean into that idea of just getting one drop of that paint as a, uh, kind of a universal color, Mm -hmm. especially with something like a space Marine that they share a large, uh, surface area of the same color. Like Mm -hmm. they just do. So, Yeah. I think that's that's a cool approach and I yeah. it. Yeah. Otherwise, I, you know, it was a pretty standard st- uh, paint job of I built up my green. I did my edge highlights. I basically washed the whole model at that point with a little bit of green shade or wash or whatever it was, and then built up highlights an additional time after that. Gotcha. I would also never really messed around with washes. So I think that was something that was fun for me with this is mm-hmm. continuing with that theme of being brave, trying a Zenithal highlight with yellow was so out of the ordinary Mm -hmm. for for me at least i've only ever done zenithal white and really just with the purpose of doing a slap chop or a speed paint and this was my first time going no okay i'm going to stay with traditional paints after using my zenithal really working on my edge highlighting which i think when you look at the sagittaire and then you look at this are night and day night and day yeah i learned so much from that sagittaire and i really got to put that experience forward with this guy Mm -hmm. a little bit of osl around the eyes didn't want to go too aggressive with it but i did that by hand i didn't do that osl with the airbrush which was cool i also did some brush osl this week yeah yeah i just i don't know i i I feel like i've said everything i can say but i just want to keep talking because i love this model so much yeah man i i would love to sit down to a game in the age of darkness and just get to see a giant wall of these guys. I spent a lot of time on this guy. I probably spent around five hours or so on this mini. The next time it would take me two or three. There was yeah. so much just learning about how to paint a space Marine. Mm-hmm. And there were, you know, trying to figure out how I was going to do my colors working with this gun. Funny enough. I think the, the, Oh, and the amount of time that I lost realizing, oh, I just edge highlighted everything and now I need to go back over it with entirely different colors. Funny enough, the biggest struggle for me on this whole model, Mm -hmm. and it's the only thing I'm not 100% satisfied with, is over with those scrolls on his uh, right hip, there's also a grenade and that grenade kind of looks like dog poop and I have no idea what to do to make that grenade look right next to the other colors on this. Yeah, it's tricky because, yeah, that kind of dark green we associate with like American frag grenades. Yeah, I'd probably just paint it like metallic 
wash it, highlight it, call it good. And even then I, I kind of tried something like that and I didn't like it. And mm. I probably went over that, that in those scrolls a dozen times. I mean, literally to the point where I was probably going to start losing detail. I, I could not figure out how to make those look good. I honestly just might not even include them <laughs> next time. Yeah, those are bits, extra bits that you can glue on. Yeah, which actually it fell off during the painting. I forgot to say that. Uh, I, I, I well, not just forgot to say it. I, I just forgot about it while I was painting that and kind of doing my first unhappy attempts with it. It entirely mm -hmm. fell off, and I had to go back and super glue it back on, which was just another one of those. Damn it, plastic glue! You're just not when plastic glue takes. It's a great hold, but it just doesn't take as often as super glue. I feel like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have to have plastic to plastic contact. I thought I did. I just didn't have enough, I guess. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. So that's everything I've got about, yeah. about that. Like I said, otherwise I'm going to sit here and keep repeating myself for no reason. So yes. I want to pass it over to you. Okay. Talk to me about your tiger. So tiger claws. Here was my idea. He's going to look like a tiger. Mission accomplished. And I was like, and he's going to have a funky base, which just turned into he's walking on blue sand, essentially. So not the funkiest thing, but a little goofy kind of compared to a lot of the bases you see in most Warhammer army schemes. So essentially what I did was I sprayed this thing with Vallejo white surface primer and didn't do any pre-shading or anything like that and then i took a uh, yellow ink from p3 and some zealot yellow from army painter speed paints mixed them up about one to one and then just hit it with a couple thin layers of that now i did remove the white shoulder they were blue tacked onto his arms for the priming process and that was the essentially the paint job before detail work. But before I did that for the stripes, a technique I learned on a model I was doing as far as undercoating is if you are going to paint a Imperial Fist, a Lamenter, any yellow chapter scheme, and you want to do it with an airbrush and you want to put dark, you know, kind of browner recesses that look a little more saturated than undercoating with brown or putting a brown glaze on, take the model and paint purple into those areas before spraying your yellow. Huh. And it gives you this really golden brown color, especially if you're doing it on something where you can really transition. Here, I was just using it to do the tiger spots those are all purple ink one layer underneath the uh ink slash speed paint base coat that went over it to make it orangish yellow and then another coat after that had dried to make it not look splotchy and you get that really kind of blackish brownish tiger stripes that i have all over this guy yeah the other thing that I wanted to do again, because the Sagittaire had got me really loving it, was panel lining. And this guy has a lot of lines that you can panel the shit out of. So I took some Agrax Earthshade, watered it down a little bit, and got to dropping it in all those little cracks and crevices. The brown complements his kind of very warm yellowish orange tone, and it makes him it really breaks up the armor panels and makes him look like less of a frozen treat. Now, quick question. Uh, now you just said panel lining, correct? Yes. So if folks are listening uh, mm -hmm. and aren't familiar with some of the techniques we're talking about, panel lining and edge highlighting have pretty similar sounding names. That is true. They do. However, where they differ is edge highlighting is taking a brush and running it along the edge of a feature on the model with a generally a brighter color than the base coat. So like if your panel of armor is blue, you will run a brighter blue, almost even a bluish gray, ending maybe even in like a sky blue or white 
at where two corners meet to really push uh, light reflecting off something. Panel lining is where you seek out crevices, cracks, that kind of stuff in a model and drop a darker, usually a wash or a speed paint into those cracks to really sell how in shadow or filled with grime they are. And they both serve to push contrast and you don't have to pick either or, but I usually do because I'm lazy. Yeah, that's probably a great note there is you can do either. You, you don't have to do either. You could do both. You could do one. You could do none. It's really up to you. They're all going to give you different effects. Yes, yes, yes. I thought it just looked better to panel line rather than edge highlight this particular model. Especially when it's already so bright. Yeah, it's very bright. Yellow is already kind of hard for the for the eyes to read at a certain point. Yeah, I've been told it's a very obnoxious color, but I don't care. I will keep making things yellow till the day I die. Oh, it is a, like it's a horribly obnoxious color, but that's that's the fun of it. Yes, that's that's what you were doing. <laughs> but yeah, yellow yellow is so interesting. I I did like your little note there about the purple, but yeah, I mean yellows. It's interesting because to paint yellow really effectively, you have to have a very good mastery of browns and oranges. Whereas for the most part, you know, if you come over back to my salamander, I use orange. And but if we remove that. What we're really looking at is just different shades of green. Right. Some of those greens are a bit more yellow than others, but mm -hmm. it's all greens. And again, yeah, really painting a good yellow model, you really need to understand when to take things outside of yellow to yes. still sell it as yellow. I think you see that a lot with reds as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you can very easily push towards uh, pink or purple when trying to brighten stuff up. It's a mm -hmm. hard color to brighten up correctly uh, if you're mixing your own stuff. I think that's something that probably a lot of folks have experienced if they've ever tried painting with these kind of traditionally warmer colors. Yeah. Versus the cool tones. The cool tones, they're, I, I feel like, generally a little bit easier. Oh, much more forgiving. You might use a, a little bit of a purple or, a, or something like that within your blues, but you don't really have to think about it as much. I don't know, just kind of a, a little observation there. Yeah, I do. You know what stinks is I. Now that I'm sitting here looking at your guy and then looking at my guy, I do sort of wish I had taken the time to do a base for him. Yeah, you know, but that's just that can be a, a preference thing. I love doing bases for my models. It is one of the most therapeutic parts of the hobby for me. Mm. That was not to come back to it. But one of my biggest gripes with the gold dragon was he had a base that I couldn't take him off of. And I didn't really like the one he had. I still think about that, even yeah. though it's been a while. It's tearing us up. I never recovered the the whole big flat base that was supposed to be in there. So I really do just have the the little rocky thing that he came on. If I ever do end up using that for a D&D game and I like know it's coming up, I probably will give him a more real base and I'll probably go back over what he has and like throw down some gravel and some cork and whatnot and just try to sell that a bit more. Make it more interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so the other two big parts of this model were the custom chapter badge on his, or three, I guess, were the custom chapter badge, which is three downward-facing tiger stripes that are more angular and less camouflage than the stuff on the rest of him. Which were all right. I think I did those all right. If I could go back and do them again, I probably would. Yeah, did you uh, freehand or did you mask? I freehanded. Yeah, that was something I want to try to get better at. When I inevitably finish my World Eaters, I am going to threaten the listener and DJ or TJ with a uh, episode where I just talk about how I painted my World Eaters army for like two hours and uh you all have to suffer through it but oh boy when i i it, we might have to make it two parts one about the angron model and one about the rest of the army because i'm still in the process of painting him and it is one of my favorite paint jobs i have ever yeah, done i've been loving day. watching process your, your progress on your angron 
yeah, I mean, yeah. you already know about my weird idea for how I'm going to try to do my Tyranids, and I have no idea how it'll play. Yeah, I'm excited to see that. But to get back to my Space Marine, my Tiger Claw, I also did some OSL. Uh, and this worked out a lot better than the Sagittar. OSL works for me when I have a more complicated surface, which I know is not all it's ever good for, but you have to get the things very just so um when it's like just a little dot circle at least in my head versus i can be a little more sloppy when i've got uh like glowing power coils or or eyes or something like that so i basically on his right power claw that has energy coils unlike the left power claw so i dry brushed those white after painting them in metallics and then mixed probably two parts water one part speed paint plasmatic bolt which is very good for laser effects glowing bits it's kind of a neony greenish blue and i just glazed that all over the power cores up onto the power generator on it, the forearm and a little bit down onto the claws and got this really nice powered up power claw effect that matches his eyes. Yeah. And kind of adds a nice pop of another color. And also because the base is blue, his power sources are green. That makes yellow, which is the color of his armor. So a nice little thematic uh, through line. Yeah. I don't know if you've caught this yet, but I know, at least for me, I'm very new to trying OSL and mm. I find that it, seems to play better the further the model is from me the the like the more i zoom in on something yes. the more i go oh that looks a little goofy but from that three foot table range you can get some really good play from it yeah you definitely can i have not done uh airbrush osl in a long time and i uh, brush osl is much quicker though not as smooth yeah but for a guy like this if he were part of a kill team he would look great from tabletop range. Yeah, I think that's something I keep coming back to with my salamander. So I like him a lot up close. He is at the end of the day without being, you know, a hero model. He's just a space marine. Space mm -hmm. marines are always going to look really good at that at that three foot. Yeah, they're just mathematically created in a lab to look good at that range. Yep. Yeah, they're bigger than normal dudes, so you can tell that they're a dude. You know, because guardsmen look very small from a three foot table range, even since their models got updated to be bigger. And yeah, Space Marines are just chunky boys that look good from that range. You know, is something that I think is kind of interesting is so you looking at this model and you've also seen my Demon Prince model. I have. This is a fact. And I, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but I thought it was kind of interesting showing this to some of my friends who, you know, they're into the tabletop stuff, but they're not as into the painting side. Right. And what I thought was very interesting is, for instance, my buddy Doyle was, uh, when I was showing this off to him and I was so proud of it, his reaction was a little more lukewarm when I'm sitting there saying like, yeah, and I think this is the best thing I've ever painted. And he's going to, I, I don't know. I, I like that demon prince better. Meanwhile, like you or my friend Shayla over at spider town hobbies, check her out. Yep. Spider town. Did I just mess that up? Spider moon. Uh, no, it's uh, a spider. The spider seller. Teacher. Spider seller. God yeah. damn it. When am I, I'm having a, we <laughs> manscaped let us do ad reads we are good at it we swear. i can i can read i just can't remember there's a real rogal dorn over here can't fucking read anyways you know i sent a picture of this over to her who's a great painter yes. or even a couple of my other 40k friends that are more into painting and all of them were having much bigger reactions and I think that's something interesting about this type of model versus something of that, you know, your hero model like a demon prince. It's not as interesting of a sculpt. So I think you can get tricked into not appreciating a really good paint job as much. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Oh, a thousand percent. I think this is a really good counterpoint to what we talked about with the gold dragon. Right? Like that model, you could whip out every 
paint. We could have Mr. Dun- Two Thin Coats himself, Duncan Rhodes, go to town on that thing. Or, you know, some Golden Demon winners. And I'm pretty sure... It's that, only going to be so... Yeah, good. it's got a cap. Yeah. Which I think the wow factor is definitely capped on these Mark VI Space Marines. Sure. Because they are guys walking or guys bracing to shoot. Yep. So obviously, you know, it's not like Angron who's like just landed and his wings are folded and he's got a fucking eight foot long chainsaw axe. Like he's covered in skulls. Like there's nothing like that to really just go, wow. But the simplicity of the canvas that when paired with the quality of it, I think lets people who really like painting experiment. And just the reason the Space Marine is such a popular canvas is because it really is. You can do whatever you want with it. Yeah, they can be super clean. They can be super dirty. They can be kit bashed nine ways to Sunday for as much guff as people who play other factions and might feel about you know, Space Marines kind of being the poster boys and getting all the special toys. There is a real power to their their design as a model. Sure. There's a reason they're so iconic. Yes. Yes. Is it the goofy giant shoulder pads? Yeah, 90% it's goofy giant. The goofy giant shoulder pads don't hurt. Actually, that just no. reminded remind me to come back to the shoulder pad story. Okay. Oh, with the with the with the printers. No, actually, I was going to say my first time making Space Marines. Oh, okay. I guess I'll just, I'll just, I don't know I'm going to bury it. I'll just talk about it right here. So actually, once again, my buddy Doyle, the one who I was just referencing as he was like, yeah, I mean, it's okay. I like your Demon Prince better. So he was the guy I got into Warhammer with Uh way back when we were kids. We were the two that said, let's play D&D. We were the two that said, let's play Warhammer. As he got into Warhammer and towards 40K instead of fantasy, because... Back in fantasy, he was also the guy that I said he was a Bretonian player. Uh huh. Why would you play regular dudes when you could play dragons? Then he went over and he said, all right, I'm going to play 40K. I'm going to play Blood Angels. Nowadays, mm-hmm. he's playing Tau. But it was Blood Angels then. And I showed up at his house to help him put together his Marines because he'd gotten a box. Me and my infinite young child wisdom of being, you know, 12, 13, whatever it was, uh, I wasn't really talking with him a whole lot. We were just building stuff while watching, I want to say like Flight of the Concords or something when that was coming <laughs> out brand new. And uh, my experience with big dumb shoulder pads was Dragon Ball Z. Oh, okay. So I put on all of his shoulder pads the wrong way and he didn't notice until everything had already cured. Oh, no. <laughs> but I was building all of his Marines with the flat edge going towards his head and then everything you know sticking out super far yeah. like uh, again like saiyan armor or that's like Game hey Force. that's something you could do I, that's st- yeah i mean look i legit think it looks better than actual like even today i'm like I, I still think it looks better and i'll tell you man the whole time i was building this guy i was thinking about that you were like i should do it like <laughs> uh, yeah it was just like I uh, I had this goofy idea, and I already came into this. I knew I was making salamanders. I was making salamanders. I made salamanders. So when I was thinking about the edge highlighting that I did back on the Sagittaire, one thing that I kind of keep coming back to is, you know, if I had done that with a black instead of with the highlight tone, especially with how, like, thick and sort of imprecise it was, it would have looked almost like cell shading. Yeah. And so I've had this idea in my head about, like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to do a cell shaded model? That is a technique. There are people doing it. It's very cool. And so I had this goofy idea of like, oh, what if for my Marine, I did the Dragon Ball Z shoulders and then cell shaded them and just went like full DBZ fighters for my Space Marine. It's a fun idea for the future. Yeah, lend lend the Salamanders your power. People of Nocturne, lend us your strength. Yep. Yeah, I I, uh, I did that style on a uh, Marvel Crisis Protocol Captain America model. Oh, okay. And I want to go back to that box and try some more of them. Yeah. uh, Because that box comes with a lot of superheroes. Marvel Crisis Protocol. If you are a uh, comic book nerd, those models, uh, you do have to put them together like Citadel models. They rule, though. Uh, I enjoyed putting them together. 
and they look really fun, especially if you try to do them in the kind of like very poppy cell shaded art style, because it's very different from Warhammer. So I enjoyed doing that. Yeah, I'd really like to try some like very specifically anime themed models in a cell shade style. Yeah, I think that'd be a lot of fun. Or even like, uh, I guess really the Marvel thing makes sense, too, because I was thinking about even like, you know, your Marvel versus Capcom kind of stuff or mm-hmm. DBZ fighters, any of those. I don't fighting games make me think about cell shading now, I guess. But yeah, I just think that'd be really fun to to try. Arc System Works, they've just been dominating everyone in the the fighting game uh, visuals department. Yeah, getting bodied. Yeah, yeah. But Street Fighter Six looks pretty good, so it does. I'm I'm pretty interesting. I wasn't a huge fan of Five, especially just because of what was going on with the release itself. Five, but I love Street Fighter Four. Man, oh really? man, oh man. Oh, we played the hell out of that played the hell out of four i liked that third strike was awesome yeah third strike is like peak 90s fighting game energy for me i love yeah. Third strike if there's a whenever i go to like a barcade i am like y'all motherfuckers got third strike let me let me jump around to sakura a bunch my fucking bullshit step dash or not sakura uh chun li no not chun li the gal in the gi. Why am I forgetting her name? She's in. Third oh Strike. yeah, yeah. I'm also spacing on her name, but my my. Kiyomi? My buddy Doyle really likes that character. Yeah, she's really fun. She's like I think... a really interesting. Like she's got the slowest walk speed in the game, but she can like do this crazy dash, and she's got a command grab that combos into the dash. Mm-hmm. Not a lot of Street Fighter games have touch of death characters, and she is one of them. I think Chun has a TOD as well. But I could in be wrong. Third Strike? Yeah, I think I think she does in Third Strike. She's really strong. Oh, yeah, she's game. insane. I personally, unfortunately for me, my favorite character is Q. Well, Q, yeah, come on. Q's the greatest. He's he's not great, but I sure oh, no. love him. I, I sure love him. I love 12. Oh, God, 12 is so much fun. I wish I was better with him. My buddies have had this longstanding tradition. I'm not a big fighting games guy. I really like watching them. I feel like I could even coach them. My thumbs can't do what I tell them to do. I just, it's and I just, tricky. I get, I dude, I end up getting mad. I, and you know me, I don't really, I'm not really an angry guy. Yeah, especially at video games. But fighting games bring it out of me. Fighting games really bring it out in me in a way that just nothing else does. I don't know why. It's like my, pri- like, even when I used to do martial arts, I didn't get mad when sparring or anything, but you put me in a game of Street Fighter and I, I get so mad I leave. <laughs> I'm serious. I it, It's so embarrassing. The last time I really sat down, I was trying to get competitive with DBZ fighters and I just, after pouring hours and hours and hours and days and weeks into it, Buddy showed up and just bodied me like five games in a row. And I was just like, I, I got to go for a walk. And I just yeah. went for a walk for like three hours at midnight. Like I was just hot i could not i couldn't deal yeah man it's they're tricky it's a different kind of game than the the tabletop war games that we paint stuff for yeah your thumbs do a lot more of the talking than your your brain yeah 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 well and i you know too i've got some pretty bad arthritis problems which yeah definitely makes the painting and building models thing difficult but Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I can't do certain things fast enough. Like even, uh, I've beaten and beaten the hell out of every Souls game except Sekiro. Oh yeah, just because of the parrying. Yeah, my, my left index, I literally can't go fast enough to handle certain fights. And it's like, I, it's just, it's not something I can do. All that to get back to, my buddies have had a longstanding tradition of birthday beatdowns. So whenever it's your birthday, you have to play you. You get to pick the fighting game, but then you have to play the fighting game nonstop with your friends until you've lost the same number of times as you are now old. Oh, gosh. So, you know, imagine a guy like me who I already get kind of heated during fighting games. And all I want to do is play Q. And then it's like, ah, you know, whatever it was. Happy 23rd birthday, TJ. You're going to sit here for three hours. Yeah. Because it's not, it's not you lose 23 times, it's you lose 23 full matches, you know, best of threes. Right, right. Yeah, that is, 
exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> to quote Street Fighter 3, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, yeah. I love the announcer from that game. <laughs> so many good, just random voice lines. I love how many dumb things that you can throw at people. Basketball, roses, come on. <laughs> it's great. Yep. To kind of uh, steer back to the Space Marine. The Space Marine fighting game. Yeah, of course. The the space the game, Space Marine, for the Xbox 360. Dude, I actually just replayed that. Well, they're making a new one. So. Yeah, no, I know. You remember I told you that my computer exploded on me because I was an idiot and I... Uh, wasn't plugged into my gpu Uh the last night that the that the old processor lived i had downloaded modded the crap out of played and beat space marine (laughs) like just like sat down and did the whole thing and then it was like after that that i had set up my last stl file and then woke up to a dead computer unfortunate yeah so the last thing that that old processor ever got to experience was space marine and what an experience it was it wasn't as good as i remembered no probably not (laughs) it was a lot worse than i remembered yeah like a lot well hopefully the mids i mean hey this new one does tie in pretty heavily to where the lore is at now with the new high fleet uh leviathan invasion well and look games are have come a long way since then and i think the problem that that old space marine game had was that it was a less good clone of gears of war right and i think now hopefully they're in a position where they're going to be a little bit braver it's probably like borrowing a lot from like god of war 2018 right that's probably the direction they go no i mean i imagine it'll still be a gears of war game at the end of the day but probably just put together with a little bit more spit and shine we'll see and I think if I recall, and this has been a, a minute, but if I recall, it didn't have a great cover system. And the cover system is what made Gears of War so fun. Yeah, I think that's what it was, is it was kind of Gears of war but also hack and slash. And you don't want hack and slash. You want kill a bunch of things tactically while using uh-huh. cover to your advantage in your Gears of War game. Mm-hmm. If, I, if I remember right, that was kind of the weirdness which, of it. Was which kind like, of gets into the hilarious dichotomy of the Space Marine as a concept. They are either, depending on who you're talking to, yeah, uh, yeah. hyper tactical soldiers clad in fine body armor and delivering pinpoint accurate bolt gun fire that devastates enemy armor and infantry alike, or they're giant screaming maniacs with chainsaws. And somehow both of these things are equally effective. <laughs> equally effective and equally true. Yes. Well, and that is, I mean, not even trying to think how I want to say this. I mean, so there's, you know, each chapter has whichever direction they kind of lean towards as well. Most of the time precipitated by their daddy issues. Well, that's just it, right? Like uh, Angron and his crew, even before they got demons put into their bodies, they were already pretty get in there. Yes. With an axe kind of guys. I mean, like when he was first put in charge of the world eaters, he he killed each captain of the chapter that was already there. Like he just murdered them because he was mad at his dad. Yeah. It's not awesome. And shock of all shocks, the one captain that survived Karn, the betrayer. Hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, what did he do? Yeah. What did he do? Uh, turns out he's also got daddy issues. Neat. You know, it's uh, it's kind of daddy issues all the way down with these uh, Space Marine guys. Yeah. But uh, no, I think I think you're exactly right. It is it is weird. That's I think probably more true of a Space Marine than anybody else in 40K, right? Yeah. That they yeah. kind of are whatever you need them to be. And I guess that's maybe why part of their popularity, part of why they are so popular is a Space Marine. Any one Space Marine is sort of whatever you need them to be. That guy could have a las cannon, or he could have a sniper rifle, or he could have a bolter or a chainsword, and he's going to be pretty damn good with all of them. Yeah, um, you don't have to specialize as much as you do if you are regular dudes with flashlights. Mm-hmm. Or uh, I think probably the most extreme example of hyper specialization is Tyranids, where you were born to be exactly this one thing, and you can never do anything else. Yeah, you are born to be a gun. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You were literally born with guns for hands. Yes, it is probably the most 
hilarious aspect. And I think what makes them a, uh, they have multiple iconic units because the units share so many visual signifiers yeah that i think can for some folks get stale i think that's a, a you know, uh yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a valid criticism i think that's probably true of 40k in general if i'm being honest yeah any amount of warhammer there's only so much variation across your army because you want your army to look coherent, right? Yeah. So all space bugs at the end of the day look like bugs. All space marines look like space marines. And chaos space marines are just space marines wearing spikes. Yeah, chaos space marines are just space marines, but a huge pain in the ass to paint. Yeah, yeah they are the evil Ryu <laughs> to the space marines Ryu. They are pretty, pretty solidly just a palette swap. Now, that has gotten better over time yes definitely so but it doesn't change the fact that chaos space marines suck to paint come at me they do the spikes are not fun the spikes are exhausting the amount of trim is ju it's just too much i would describe it as a comedy amount of trim yeah it's a comedic amount of trim and again i'm the guy that just dedicated the last every episode we've done of this show to trying to get better at edge highlighting yeah not a thing I plan to stop anytime soon. I'm really trying to get better at it. There's too much trim. Yeah, it's a lot of trim. It it's is a lot trim. of trim. I'm doing the current possessed kit instead of the new eight bound kit for my eight bound for my world eaters because, okay. uh, well, eight bound are possessed, but better. -er -er -er. Sure. And you can field them in squads of five. They come in boxes of three. They have the same base size as possessed. This is not a hard equation. Yeah. But those possessed hilariously, despite not being dedicated to corn, are much spikier than the eight bound. So I have literally bled for those models, not from cutting myself with a hobby knife, but from shanking myself with a spike on one of their shoulder pads. God, that dragon miniature. Heldrake. <laughs> No, no, no. Not even Warhammer. Just, you know, that I'm working on that colossal. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Colossal. Because last week I learned, or two weeks ago, or whatever it was, that a uh, gargantuan might actually be the end point for fifth edition. I don't actually know if they go to colossal anymore. Gotcha. Anyways, that big ass dragon I'm working on, it is so spiky. I have beat the hell out of my hands just trying to assemble this thing, dude. It stinks. It is so hard to work with that model. Yeah. And, uh, it's and, cool as hell, but yeah, and God, to, it hurts. to to reiterate again, like. Little Timmy, when he goes into a games workshop and sees Space Marines, they're not going to hurt his hands. They're not going to hurt their hands. Yeah, I don't think Little Timmy's thinking about that. That's true. That's something you only think about if you're an old grognard. Yeah. Like, little kid isn't going, ow, it's going to spike me. He's going like, whoa, that's, that's really cool. Metal. It's freaking spiky. Yeah, that's true. That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. I guess I'm saying if you're a parent and you want your children painting uh horrible transhuman weapons of war don't get them the spiky ones because they will poke their hands yep give them a repentia squad yeah yeah <laughs> that that uh yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i'm sure the the more that's what you should give your young children yes repentia squads yeah explain that to them yep <laughs> yeah yeah, explain uh, dereliction of your god and repentance through death uh, to your children. I mean, to be fair, if you're Catholic, it's not. Yeah, it's uh, taught. yeah, that's that's true. That's that's true. not even like that's not even a a barb. They just normally don't look quite as uh, Catholic nuns don't look quite as bondagey as repentia. No, well, <laughs> just repentia. <laughs> Well, yeah, the, yeah. most of that line, except for just, like, whatever the standard battle sisters are. I don't know what they're called. Dude, God, sisters of battle are really freaking cool, though. They are. They God, are. I think they they're also, so cool. Well, they're also wearing power armor, and they have bolt guns. And they have really good flamethrowers. I think I just like flamethrowers. Flamethrowers are cool. Because when I was debating who my good guy army is going to be, I was really torn between Salamanders and Sisters of Battle. Uh, sisters are not good guys. <laughs> they are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, ultimately, I've no one learned is. as much. 
uh, when I, I guess how about this? I don't know what my dividing line for good and evil would be, but I like I don't know how to classify it. But if we sit here and go like Necrons, good or evil? Probably evil. Yeah, I'm gonna put them on evil. Tau, yeah. good or evil? Closer yeah, they, to good. Yeah, but they do a lot of fucked they do up a lot things. of horrible things. Yeah, closer to good. Orcs, good or evil? I'd say neutral. Sure, maybe. Maybe. But I'm gonna put them more on the. If if I'm gonna put if I have to put Tyranids on evil, I'm gonna have to put orcs on evil. Yeah, I I would put on the alignment if we're doing the the three by three alignment chart. Uh, Tyranids are hungry and orcs are uh, just football hooligans. Yeah, are violent. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, so all of that to say, I mean, sisters of battle. If I'm if I'm sitting here with like the way I just laid that out, oh, right? The emulator tank. There rules more towards the good half of this world that of this universe that doesn't really have good in it Uh uh-huh they're more trying to be on that good side they think that they're the good guys like necrons don't even think they're the good guys oh yeah if you've ever listened to treason talk he's like i like putting worlds in my museum (laughs) yeah like you know what i'm saying at least the sisters of battle think they're doing good stuff Mm-hmm. and sometimes they're less wrong yeah to a certain extent yeah so anyways i think they're cool but most importantly i really like flamethrowers and i was like if my quote-unquote good guys have flamethrowers that would be cool and then i happened to buy an age of darkness box because we thought we were going to get into 30k together and then it sat on a shelf for a year uh, there's still time for that to happen <laughs> yeah <laughs> we just got to get closer together yeah you realize besides that one 500 point game we played when you were like i'm gonna teach you how to play uh, we've never actually played a game of 40k hey once i get the guest room up and running man you are free to come visit for uh local rtts because we do have them pretty regularly that's yeah like i don't have of my buddies here that play none of them play often enough for me to like really learn the rules and get good yeah it's yeah. like they're kind of relying on me to know the rules and i'm like that's not a good bet yeah that is a bad idea <laughs> and they're all about to change anyway so <laughs> that's the other thing they're always changing that's what I was yelling about at the beginning of the episode. <laughs> and another thing. Another damn, yeah. That's what I was saying before the episode started, but we were already recording. You're, you're literally turning into Grandpa Simpson. I used to be with it, and then what it was changed, and now I'm not with it anymore. And what's hip scares me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, can't, that's, that's every single person's experience. At first, you're young, then that happens, then you die. Yeah, yeah. There's no... <laughs> like like I, no okay I, it's really funny i was thinking about this today like i was uh i was at my local starbucks ordering a, a coffee before we started recording this because you know i wanted to go read outside and they have tables that are outside it sounded nice and then i walk in and there's some weezer playing oh yeah 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 say it you ain't so wheeze. say it ain't so say it is so more like and so i'm like i'm sitting there like yeah it's going on like yeah weezer this is cool modern hip i like it and i'm like no this is and i'm looking at these the, at the the people that are making my drink and you know i talk with all of them all the time they're great and then i'm looking at this this particular guy and i go oh this is classic rock for him yeah he's hearing weezer the same way that later david bowie was playing and i went like hell yeah david bowie okay. gosh that was some good stuff i wish i was around for david bowie's heyday uh-huh. good old classic rock and these guys are listening to weezer going classic rock yep <laughs> yep oh, or God. like uh, you know i've just i've always like you know i'd spent my whole life being in music and i you know i toured and i did this i did that i did whatever not that i was good just that i did it and i'm thinking about like i don't know any modern artists at yeah. all and it's Same. not TJ, it's not an intentional thing say it ain't so <laughs> yeah really blew my mind when i had that realization yeah yeah well i my music taste is mostly like weird internet mashup oh yeah you have trash taste you can't yeah, talk I am to a, me about i am a garbage can of a music consumer earlier in this episode i said that i like ska and my taste uh-huh. in music is still better than yours <laughs> Uh, he's not wrong, ladies and gentlemen. He is not wrong. If I had my way, 
the intro to this would probably be uh, something that made you just turn off the podcast. So in an effort to have this uh, be any <laughs> in any way listable, I will probably uh, not do that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Canon, tell you what, uh, the last two episodes we've done this and I think it would work well uh, just in general. Let's uh let's take a quick water break and then we'll come back and, and hit the back half or yeah. back less than half and, yeah. and wrap this guy up. All right. We'll see you right. after the break. Hey everybody, thank you for waiting around. Uh, as we're coming back, I just want to remind you, please, 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 whether this is YouTube or Spotify or whatever your situation is for listening. Uh, please give us your like, your subscribe, comments if it's relevant, really whatever it is. Uh, it helps us so much as far as just being able to get this out in front of more people, and it costs you absolutely nothing. Yeah, and remember, listeners out there in Radio Land, uh, yeah, check out our Instagram for works in progress and to see our uh personal projects from time to time as well as the miniatures that we talk about here on the podcast and don't forget to tag us with what you are working on because we always love seeing what the community is up to and what you guys are using for your creative outlets absolutely i mean we're trying to build it up so that not only can you show us what you're working on but perhaps you can even kind of work in tandem with us i think that'd be a lot of fun yeah hobbying together Exactly. It's just a cool way to build our little community. And of course, finally, don't forget, you can always send us an email or shoot us direct messages to let us know if you think you have a really great idea for what we should be doing next. Yeah. There's a million models out there and you can easily fall into analysis paralysis. Hey, that rhymes. Look, at a certain point, I'm incentivized to say, let's do Battletech every single week so that I can complete my lamps. And yeah. while that might be satisfying for me, it might not make for a great show. So I'd love to know what you would think makes a great show. So all of that, let's get back to the actual episode, huh? Yes, 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 yes. TJ, Space Marines are awesome. Sure. But they're not for everybody. Right. Give us your little column A, your little column B on what you're kind of like, I like this a lot. Not a fan of this. Okay. Because that exists for every model. And specifically, we are talking about the Mark VI Age of Darkness Space Marine model. Yes. My biggest issue when it comes to painting the Space Marine, you kind of heard me rant about this already once. Technically, the kit as it comes is a well-made kit. It's high quality. There's good things to paint on there. Lots of good accessories. So you can really make your guy look the way you want him to look. I love all of that. And you can totally leave the statement there. My criticism of really space Marines in general is in the way that they're sold. Mm. My biggest issue is that if I'm going to run a squad of 10 tactical Marines, which again, if you're not a big Warhammer guy, this is a tactical Marine that we did, right? Outside of the Age of Darkness box, you could go out and you can buy a box of tactical marines that comes with 10 dudes. Uh, no, no, sir. No. They now come with 20. And they, they come are with 20. 80 American dollars. Okay. So we're talking about a big purchase, right? With a it's... lot of guys in it. One of the things that's always irked me, and it comes down to why I printed these bits, is that I don't want to just use the generic Mark VI helmet and the more importantly the generic mark six shoulder and then use some little transfer sheet decal in order to make that shoulder stand out and you know uh -huh. have their iconography that's always been my criticism with a space marine is that for me to make my space marine look the way i feel like it ought to look i have to buy forge world upgrade kits yeah. and the upgrade kit is 2450 for the for 10 heads 2450 for 10 shoulders now you just told me I have to buy two of each of those because it's a 20 Marine pack. So my $80 box of Marines is actually going to cost me $180 to make the way I want. Yeah. And that's before considering special weapons. If I want to start giving them flamers, then it's, I don't even remember how much for each group of 10 flamers. So it starts to become an issue for that reason. That's really my criticism of space Marines in general. Mm-hmm. And that's a tough one for me to swallow when, 
if I look over at Tyranids, the way that I can accurately signify which hive fleet they're a part of is just I chose to paint red instead of blue. Yeah. And again, it, I know that this is all it's optional, right? You can use the transfer sheet. You don't even necessarily have to. We, we could but, just get good in freehand. I hear you saying it right now. We could do that. Look, and I'd actually, you know, what's funny is as much as I want to get good at freehanding, I'd still rather have the hard sculpt for that chapter symbol. Mm -hmm. I just think it looks better. It feels better to me. Yes. That's my criticism at the end of the day. It's nothing to do with the quality of this guy. This is a phenomenal model. It's fun. You can get good at edge work. You can get good at panel shades. You can get good at OSL. You can do anything. It is the ultimate canvas. Mm -hmm. So my criticism is just for a guy like me who really wants that ultra specific detail to come out, it kind of lets me down a bit. That would be my criticism. But otherwise, again, I can't state this enough. Mm -hmm. Mark six Marines are awesome. They're, They're so yeah. good to paint. They roll. I loved this model. And even if I used the generic shoulder and generic head, I still would have had a good time but it wouldn't have been quite as salamandery to me. Mm -hmm. That being said, I mean, frankly, if I was going for something like a, like your guy here, then I wouldn't care about having those slightly better bits. So I don't know what the answer is. Uh, I don't think it's reasonable for me to sit here and say, I wish that they sold 10 packs specifically of salamanders, but I don't know, maybe it is reasonable for me to say that. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you fix it in a way that's also fair to Games Workshop but doing everything the Games Workshop way doesn't quite feel fair to me. And it's why I ultimately did a little bit of 3D printing for my head and shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. The customization stuff is very tricky. And I think it part of this gets into the, the game that these are for. These can be used for Warhammer 40,000, of course, but they were made for Warhammer The Age of Darkness or Warhammer Horse Heresy 2nd Edition which has always been a much more expensive endeavor from its inception. Unless uh, you were in uh, a Australian, I guess, when the game started, because evidently through some freak accident, Forge World Resin used to be cheaper than GW Plastic in Australia, which boggles my mind. I actually but, didn't know that. Yeah. I think that's another important piece here, actually. If I was just doing these as 10th edition salamanders, I might not even care as much. But one of the cool things about Horus Heresy is it's a game where people take the thought and attention to detail and lore of what's happening in the battle a lot more seriously. Mm -hmm. And so that extra detail of this is unmistakably a salamander, not a dark angel matters mm -hmm. more. Yeah, that's kind of my bit. How about you, man? What about your guys? For me... This was a really fun time to mix and match bit parts to recreate one of my favorite subsettings in the Warhammer universe, the Bad Ab War. And because we do a lot of one off models, I'll tell you guys right now, you're probably going to see a lot more Bad Ab inspired schemes whenever we do more Space Marines, just because I absolutely love that setting. I love a lot of those characters. To me, the Bad Ab War is very much like in uh, A New Hope when Obi-Wan just drops the bomb of I fought with your father in the Clone Wars. And as a kid, you're like, wait, there's clones and they had a war? Like, it's so uh, just like, you can't even imagine what it's like. And uh, the Bad Ab War is just that level of uh, kind of obscure that it isn't really demystified for me as a fan of it. And uh I don't know how many people did hobbying and battles in that specific theater. So bringing that little subset uh, with my favorite boys, the Lamenters, and coincidentally, Salamanders are also involved in that campaign on the other side, on the Imperial side, not the Secessionist side. Yeah, I just had so much fun getting to bring that to you guys, that very <laughs> uh, weird and uh, obscure color scheme. Now, was there anything that you disliked about this particular marine in process? I will say, I think the Tartaros slash Mark VI pattern of Power Claw is the worst Power Claw. I don't like it. And can you remind me, is that the left hand or right hand on your guy? That is the right hand. 
Okay. So this is also how the Tartaros Terminators are put together with their power claws. The same way as the Mark VI. You get a power fist, and then you have a bit that you put on over the power fist. I don't like that. I really don't like that. Hmm. I get the Wolverine claws thing, but then I want to go with the Mark VII power claws, which look goofier, but they look like claws, I guess, to my mind, better. Uh, You can see them in the Vanguard veteran kit very well. But my all time favorites are the the Cataphracti slash Mark three style power claws. Like having the the bladed fingers is just so cool. And I know it's kind of like the Night Lords thing, but I don't care. I love it on all of my dudes with power claws. That is how I want my Space Marines with power claws to look. But I think it is very cool that I got to do some OSL on the Mark six power claw. That's fair. Actually. It- yeah, I I think I do like that better, actually. It is dumb, but I like it. Oh, it's so goofy. It's so silly, but I love it. Yeah, it's dumb, but I like it. The Space Marine motto. Yeah, man. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. We got a little bit of like, we got a little bit of dislike. I think we probably already went over this, but maybe there's a, a fine point to cap on it here as to why you went with this weird little faction that you did. Well... I went with this weird little faction because they probably don't have a lot of representation on the tabletop or in an artistic space. And they are a cool little background player in the ramp up to the Badab War. They were the first guardians of the Maelstrom Zone and their story has been lost to humanity. And I wanted to show one of these venerable guardians tramping across the blue soil of an alien world while they do battle with pirates, aliens, and the forces of chaos to keep the Imperium's beleaguered supply lines open before they were subsumed by the warp. So a lot of lore. (laughs) Yeah, I get it. I mean, I get it. For me, that was ultimately kind of it, too. Mine's not nearly as well thought out as yours, but I I wanted some good guys that I felt like were easier to call the good guys because I play so many bad guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, fire is cool. Yep. The Sons of Vulcan deliver on that front. That's really what it came down to. Fire is really cool. Speaking of delivering, you are a salamander boy when it comes to loyalist space marines, and you like Mm -hmm. bugs. So this upcoming leviathan box is i'm basically gonna buy just, the entire box yeah yeah it's just start collecting tj yeah basically. yeah no it really is i've been uh joking about that with one yeah. of my dnd group most of them have at least one space marine army and then something else and a couple of guys in the group or a couple of guys that are tangentially related to the group i'm not really friends with them are bug players so everyone's talking about who they're going to split these boxes with i'm like screw you guys i'm getting a box right like I'm so, not I'm not splitting this with anybody. Yeah, this yeah. I'm going to build both halves of this thing. Yeah. So combining it with your uh Age of Darkness. Absolutely. Yeah, you'll have uh and your pre-existing nids. Yeah, absolutely. I don't have the space for it right now, but one of my long-time dreams has been to basically take my current bookshelves of models and instead of just having them be random models, actually go full diorama. Yeah. Yeah, that would be cool. I mean, that'd be great. I mean, that's a a good classic story of salamanders versus tyranids. That can easily fill a diorama space. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Originally, I wanted it to be chaos versus orcs, so I still might try to make that happen. Yeah. Dioramas are fun. Maybe someday we'll... when When we get them done, we'll do episodes on our dioramas, maybe. Oh, yeah, I'd love to do it. I mean, I honestly... Even as far as just for storing my models before I go play a game at the local store. Yeah. I just think it's cool that they're in a diorama and then yeah. I'm plucking them out of there to put them in my case. There's some guys at RRTT locally that do that. One guy has a guard diorama. Dude, it's big enough that it has a slot for his Bane Blade. It's Love it. awesome. If I wasn't in an apartment, if I had you know a house that I could really permanently shell up in and had a, a hobby room instead of a hobby you know, corner. <laughs> yeah. A hobby hallway. Yeah. Which it is. I'm, I work out of a hallway right now. Cause there's not a room 
not even a corner. It's a, it's a weird setup. Yeah. But yeah, man, I, I'd love to have just cool permanent displays, especially like if I was ever like a game shop owner or something. Oh, yeah. Wow. I wouldn't just do the glass cases. I would absolutely try to uh, diorama them out. Yeah, man. I just think that's, that's so, so neat. Cool. So cool. Okay. Very last things here then. If you were to do this again with hindsight, what would you do different? Who do you recommend this guy to? Who do you not recommend this guy to? So what would I do different? I probably would have done the second coat of purple ink before breaking out the airbrush with the contrast paints. Mm. Because as I said, when I when it was done, it looked kind of splotchy and the camo was not super obvious like it is in the final pictures you guys are seeing. So I had to go over it again. And that was kind of annoying because when you're using inks over inks, sometimes they reactivate. You have to be very careful. Yeah, maybe use like a little, uh, a little, um, oh, varnish. Thank you. That would be the smart thing to do, but I am, I'm lazy when it comes to varnishing. So I would have just done probably two layers of ink, then spray just to save myself some headache later. Otherwise, really liked it. Maybe add some like alien foliage to go with that kind of alien blue base. Sure. Yeah. Because, I don't know, maybe it reads as water to some folks. It's not. It's sand mixed with Mod Podge, mixed with blue and black paint, and then dry brushed with a sky blue and uh, shaded with Drakenhof Nightshade. So it's meant to be like a dirt base. I do a lot of dirt bases. I I have a video on my YouTube channel people can go check out that's like two minutes long. I think it's for my chaos bases. It's how I do all my chaos bases. But you can swap the colors and pretty much do it with any type of weird dusty base you want to do when i'm doing basing it's almost like every base is a mini diorama i go so over the top with them it's fun yeah i absolutely love it i gush about it all the time angron's base i've shown it to you right yes yeah it fucking rules (laughs) like it's so cool it has so many skulls (laughs) actually just before i forget have you ever seen the airbrush marbling technique where you I have like, ra- yeah, so you like wrap the model with like a dryer sheet or something? Yeah, I got a Gimen model that is third party. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to do his base because the base it comes with is very flat. Sure. And featureless. So I was like, you know what this is good for? Marble. I've never tried doing the marbling on complex shapes, but I wonder if something like that would work well for kind of getting that uh, tiger stripe feel. Ooh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't it know. could be something fun to play with that's, if we ever uh, try another round of these guys. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'll say for myself, what would I do different? Uh, I would not waste as much time edge highlighting the whole model green when not all of it's going to wind up being green i also i might actually try punching up my orange a little further especially on that salamander icon or emblem whatever you want to call it i feel like i could punch that with a even more vibrant red or orange i don't think the orange that i'm using And that spot matches the saturation and vibrancy of the green throughout the armor. Gotcha. I'd be interested to try to to punch that guy up a little bit or maybe even try a little edging there that I didn't really use. Other than that, probably giving him a base. Oh, and actually, you know what? I would like to do a, uh, a little more highlighting on the gun. I like that off orangish rusty thing that i did i should have tried to go back through with something a little bit closer to white to do some more final highlights with similar to like the little keychain that he's got on the back of his gun like that tone not bright just a little bit more to help it stand out a bit right but yeah otherwise i'm i'm really damn happy i think this is yeah. technically the best model i've painted yeah so who tj do you think we would recommend this model to and who would we not I know it's a very tricky question. Yeah, because I mean, especially when we're getting with something as specific as as war games, you're I feel like the inclination is you want to go, well, you paint it if you like Space Marines and you don't paint it if you're not playing Space Marines. But I don't think that gets to the whole story here. I think. 
each of us tried something so dramatically different, right? A space marine in its own right, it has some cool shapes, but it's not the most complicated model. No. So I think who I recommend this to is anybody who wants to try to flex creativity or practice a technique you're not currently happy with. Mm-hmm. This is a, a a really awesome learning model. But similar to some other conversations we've had before, like around the Golden Dragon, or, you know, when we talked Golden Dragon, when we talked Sagittarius, one of the things we talked about is, is it even possible to go out and win something like a Golden Demon with those guys? The Gold Dragon? Absolutely not. No way. Sagittarius, it would be really hard, but maybe... It would maybe... be a Chad move to yeah. be like, I'm, I'm, I'm putting in a Sagittarius. <laughs> like... Yeah. And so... I almost put just our basic space marine like this in kind of a similar camp. Of course. Everyone in the world except for me had painted a space marine before. Yep. There's a reason for it. It's a great way to learn. It's a great way to get better. And you can really track your progress from one marine to the next because they're basically the same. Mm -hmm. To actually win a golden demon with one, it's probably not an interesting enough model for that. It feels silly going back to that being my my metric, but I mean, that's all I can think of is who doesn't paint this? Somebody who doesn't like Space Marines or is trying to actively win a painting competition because it's not a complicated enough model to win a painting competition. Right. I know. How about you? I agree with a lot of your points. I really do. I think that Space Marines are a great starting canvas for pretty much anyone. They're the right size. They've got the right combination of smooth, flat, and sharp edges to really kind of teach you how to handle each of those surfaces. They're usually like two to three colors. Like you don't have to go crazy. Yeah, they're just so good for what they do, man. And the other thing I don't think we talk about because we paint so many single models, right? And we've so far painted models that are meant to stand pretty much on their own. This guy only looks better the, the more, more of, of his battle brothers he is around. Absolutely. I think a squad of even just five of these guys rocking up on the tabletop really makes you go, oh, these are cool. Like, these guys are cool. That's actually a really good point, is even when I, you know, I'll reference back to my Tyranids here, even though they're a swarm army, there's something just kind of different about a swarm of Tyranids that look about the same and a squad of TAC Marines that look the same. Mm -hmm. Those tactical Marines, there's just something a little different in the way that the uniform hits. And that is just kind of cool. Yeah, and they're they're so easy to add little personal touches to mm -hmm. that, that they can all be related silhouette-wise, but have features that break them up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I could paint this exact same model, but with like a gun instead of the Mark III Power Claw and like a Mark VI helmet. And it looks like different. Yeah. But you can still tell they're the same group of dudes. Yeah, no, absolutely. That is uh, that is a fun thing about these guys. So I think that kind of wraps it up for today, everyone. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank yeah. you so much, and we'll catch you all next week. Yep. Have a good one, guys. Bye. Bye.